No one would dare touch moksha. So I said, why not? Let me have moksha in my a scene. So, no, madam, this is a pompous claim or not, it doesn't matter. The point is, that's the kind of thing that drew me. Welcome to The River Has No Fear of Memories, a series of conversations with Girish Karnad. This podcast is brought to you by the Bangalore International Center. My name is Arshia, and I'm here with Anmol. We recorded these conversations with Girish right before his death in June 2019. In these episodes, we have a chance to listen to Girish's wide-ranging observations about his life and his work. Along with excerpts from his plays, we'll hear various people talk about his legacy as an artist and as a public intellectual. In the previous episode about the making of modern Indian theatre, we talked about the excitement in Bombay and other theatre centres as new Indian writing for the stage began to emerge. We also looked at the people who transformed the way plays were written and staged. Here, we pick up on that excitement and see how it played out in other cities, such as Madras, where Girish lived for seven years. When I arrived in Madras in 1962, Please. There was this group called Madras Place. I talked about it yesterday. And that was an Indian group. There was another group called Madras Dramatic Theatre who did only English plays and they did not admit Indians into the group. Okay. We compensated, I think, by doing, by doing very intellectually pompous plays. They did comedies. I mean, for instance, Madras Place had done what? Pierre Gint and so on, you know, earlier. With any other group, I don't think I would have had experience of such a variety of modern plays. And uh, I'm sorry to say, I brought Indian theatre because I was in, this was at that time that I was invited to Calcutta and, you know, invited by uh, Pratibha Agarwal. And there I I met Mohan Rakesh, uh, you know. All that. I was discovering Indian theatre and I was very excited. So I brought that to Madras place and I translated Eva Mindri and got it checked by, translated from Pratibha Agarwal, got it checked by Bhagavad Sarkar. It was an immediate success. You know, you know, and then the next uh, play that was done in Madras place was Shantata Kotsala, you know, which Madras players did not do first, it was done in Bombay. But Shantata, you know, got the, got the award, Kamala Devi Chattapadi Award. That made a uh, Tendulkar. So the new era that was beginning. So, uh, in fact, I can say with some confidence, which I've said it in the book, that it is Madras players that created modern Indian theatre. One thing is for me was Madras players. The second thing was Churamandala. You know, Churamandala came up so that the idea that we must look for our own Indian style of painting and use it, you know, was brought in by Panikkar. And Vasu became a part of our group. And of course, there was music booming in those periods. Subhulakshmi and and thank God, that was a time before television had taken root. So there was an audience, people used to come to see. So that was the transitional period. I would say in 1960s and 70s, uh, where a new Indian drama really took shape. And that was also the time when the National School of Drama produced 
You see, before that, there was no sense of theatre in India. Train theatre. You know, I mean, groups used to do it, or they would do it. Eh? But a trained group of people with a philosophy, uh, this Al-Kazi produced it. Really. Girish's memories of Madras players showed that there was a real explosion in new thinking about theatre. And Girish was one of the people who tried to learn as much as he could about different forms of artistic expression. All of these would work their way into how he thought about his own plays. Girish gives a special status to the Madras players in what he thinks of as a critical historical moment in the development of modern Indian theatre. Shanta, do you agree? In his own case, he tells us that uh, he went to Calcutta and he discovered Indian theatre. Now, how did that happen? He was watching Bengali plays. He didn't know the language. But he got something from Evam Indrajit and came back and translated that. So that was, according to him, the first Indian language play uh, that went on to the English language stage. He says that, therefore, Madras players had this All India impact, which of course is a huge overstatement. But uh, uh, let's read into it what he means. And uh, what he means is that this kind of activity of bringing Indian plays onto the English stage was really not happening in Madras. There, there were English comedies happening. So as far as Madras is concerned, this was something new and it was making a statement with regard to Indian writing. But as you say, this was a moment in the theatre history of India. It was a shared moment. It was happening in Calcutta. Why else would Girish Karnad be invited to Calcutta in the first place? It was happening in Bombay, certainly, and there the key figure was Satyadev Dubey, because he was so keen on spreading the word, so to say. He kept sending plays to various friends in various places. He sent Andhayu to Ibrahim Malkazi and then suddenly it became nationally famous. See, at the center of spreading Indian language theatre was translation. Without translation, this would not have happened. And I translated Kanolkar's Avadhyaya. And that was published in Enact. So, Dubey and Enact were the conduits through which Indian theatre was passing from one state to the other. Because once it was there in English, a whole lot of people were translating it into regional languages. Uh, Dubey and Rajendra Paul were uh, cronies they were constantly at each other, interviewing each other, kneeling each other to, to continue this whole movement. Madras players through Girish was part of this movement. So in that sense, Madras players had a national impact. When I started working with Dubey in 74, 75, soon after that, when we moved to Chabildas, we were doing a play translated from Bengali, we were doing a play translated from Kannada, a play translated from Marathi, play translated from English or a European language. In, very quickly, we were part of a pan-Indian theatre sensibility. It was very clear. You know, it peaked, I think, during the Chabildas time because there were so many different languages at play. So it went on for a while, you know, it wasn't a short-lived phenomenon. Rajinder Paul, he was. And he had something called Paul's Press. You know, and he had a lot of paper wasted because he published textbooks and so on. So with that wasted paper, he brought out a journal, very shabbily done, but it contained all information as to what was happening in Trivandrum, in Manipur. Each issue had an Indian play. That was fantastic. 
and reviews. A body of Indian plays built up. That's where Hayavadana was first published. So that spread also Mohan Rakesh, uh, Tindulkar, Shantata Kotsaloe, all came out through an act. That is an amazing uh, work done for the, those 20 years by, by that journal. Which, which gave me a, a certain national identity. As a playwright, I mean, we were all, we created, like Oxford uh, poets, we were the enact playwrights we became. You must also remember that this was a small community, right? It was, you know, re literally you could count them on the fingers of two hands, that's it, right? And they were in touch with each other, there were personal relationships. But it is, uh, the way he ran the Walson uh, Terrace, there was a big carpet. We came and slept, took our pillows and slept. And if we, if we were drunk, too, home, too drunk to go, we would sleep the night and get up and go, or, or whatever it is. And one day I remember I, I went to sleep arguing with a Tindulkar and fell asleep. And next morning I woke up, wanted to continue the uh, argument. Next, who was there but Badar Sattar? Because Tindulkar had gone home at 2 o'clock. You know, he, he was in Bombay. And Badar Sarkar had come by a, a late train and come and was sleeping next to me. And I didn't even know. You know so this this is the, you know, it's... Uh, I think uh, Valjean Terrace has contributed hugely to people's growth in various ways. Because of the kind of spirit of theatre that these people embodied. It's not just given to me, it's given to theater. So the door was 24 hours open, you walked in, you walked out and participated, sat in a corner, did your own thing, whatever. So therefore it became this kind of free-flowing space in which that uh, anecdote of Girish's fits so perfectly. We also know historically that whenever there is a physical space that has a certain nurturing attitude or an open attitude towards the performing arts community, it immediately sets into motion a blossoming of activity around that space and in the space. Whether it's a Prithvi theatre or Chabildas school before that in, you know, in Dadar or even Rangashankara in the early days in Bangalore, you know. Never underestimate the value of the Addas, a place where you can hang out, chat and talk about your work and your art and you know, not always formally, you know, informally, build new relationships. Unfortunately, I think with this whole cafe culture and all this kind of thing, these, these informal spaces which don't cost you anything to be there. That's so important. You know, in cities, we always have to pay to be in spaces. But these are free spaces. I think there is huge value to that. And now, I think we need to consciously create such spaces. You know, they, they may not happen spontaneously. And if they don't, then you have to create them. I think it's absolutely important. And in this profusion of new playwriting, let's listen to Girish tell us which were the works that he admired. I thought uh, Bhashiram Kotwal, of course, was supreme, the music. You see, Tendulkar knew what humiliation lower middle class suffered for. He knew the humiliation lower middle class went through. You know, the, uh, the bitterness, the, which no other playwrights did. Badal Sarkar really took it all from UNESCO and so on. All the absurdity. Oh, are you going to the next? I'm going to the next station. Are you going to get down at the next station? Yes, I'm with you. But you didn't get down at the next no. And so on. So that ultimately, what is supposed to be absurdity, because predictability. I don't know about it. I can't judge Adi Adore. What is it saying? What, what is, what's it trying to say? A very powerful play, but what, what is it trying to say? Otherwise, as a classic play, a play that stands at the beginning of a career was uh, Andayo. It's a kind of murder in the cathedral, a ritual. Play, you know, not a storytelling play, a ritual play, a format, poetry, all that. It's not narrative. It has no purpose because you know the story. And it, it, it has no progeny. 
and he didn't he, he that's the only play he wrote and he didn't know about theater and he never wrote any other play and he wrote it as a radio play which is satyadev dibe who turned it into a stage play it was no i had to fight for it didn't you know when i was in the sang i'm sorry i keep patting my own back but um, when i was in sangeet natak then first year we said which play i said of course andhayog but they mm-hmm. said andhayog but you know there is a people feel that it's not a play it's poetry it's lyricism people can't decide whether it's prose or you know people say it's this and i said which people say you know i i really said which people say we are the people to decide we are the sangeet natak academy sitting here you know and if we say it is play it's a play no one can challenge us and it that got accepted got the award it had not been given an award for 35 years and i said no so what a great place survives for 35 years shanta let's talk about tendulkar's ghasiram kotwal i mean like hayavadana no one who's seen it ever forgets it i'm very amused at girish's comment because he says rather hurriedly that uh, ghasiram was a great play and then instantly talks about the music bhaskar's music and uh, i'm just thinking back to poor mr tendulkar himself because if a person like girish the first thing he comments on about ghasiram is the music then it confirms tendulkar's opinion that the music overpowered the play but girish doesn't say the same thing about karan's music for hayavadana he doesn't believe that the music overpowers the play even though hayavadana songs have become part of the lore as he says of kannada theater music but that's the difference where what is tendulkar writing he comes from this strong realistic tradition of play writing you know that he never again or before wrote a play like kashiram that was a one off thing and for him the uh, message as we call it simplistically was the important thing i think on the page as he wrote the song he saw them as words he <laughs> didn't think of how it would be when they were set to music so uh, having come from that tradition this was his approach to any play that was written that was not girish's approach girish was in fact trying to get to 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 grips with a uh, folk form masks and music and movement and uh, karant came from the same background so karant did exactly what girish wrote But as much as Girish admired Tendulkar, there were some aspects of Tendulkar's plays that really bothered him. It's the essay is called Tendulkar Uttar Paksh. You know, Uttar Paksh in um, is is to say, yeah, I've understood the side. Now I'll dismantle. My point was that Tendulkar claimed, you know, to write about the meanness in society. the narrowness narrow mindedness this and ultimately he joined them you know t- uh, let me give an example i have given example example i have made myself very unpopular but for instance shantata quotes all way is all about a single woman you know and they're doing a play and they use this occasion to harass her and they make out that a uh, fantastic accusation that she is um, pregnant and she is had an affair with someone and you know a single woman will be like that and then suddenly the rehearsal time comes over and they go after that tendulkar gives her a monologue and the monologue she says me pap ke lo i am pregnant i have slept with the, i mean i said i mean you have written a whole play about if you see a single woman you immediately assume that she will do all these things and she does it i mean she used to that you you prove, you go on to prove her 
This Kanyadan is a super example. In Kanyadan, there is a liberal social liberal who all says, you can marry any Dalit, anything, anyone does yeah. And he and his wife are great socialists. His daughter falls in love with a Dalit poet. He marries her. And uh, marries her to him, she doesn't stand in the way, and so on. And um, marriage falls to the ground. He drinks, he beats his um, the wife. And he says, well, this is how to do in our, you know, we don't do it. We do it, this is how we... And uh, it, it became a big rumpus because people thought this was about Dasar, Namdev Dasar and so on. But the play ends with the daughter coming and accusing the father, your liberalism destroyed me. You let me do what I like. Why didn't you stop me? Really? Little, little easy. And she says, you liberals, you are the destroyers of society. And do you know how the play ends? Mm -hmm. The daughter walks out and the whole house collapses. Funny thing is, Shamanan Jalan did the play. And I talked to Shamanan. Shamanan, look, she's a grown up woman, 25, she's married a Dalit. Well, it's her fate. I mean, why? why? You putting it on the father's head. You know, how is he responsible? Even Shaman and that, I didn't see it like that. And this is true also of uh, uh, Sesa Kharambanda. This is exactly like what Lakshmi thinks will happen and it happens. Tindulkar is supplying her with the data to justify Lakshmi's point of view. And um, but he, when I told him, he couldn't see it at all. But he thinks exactly like his villains. And of course, Tendulkar turns all his contemporary plays into melodramas. The thing about Tendulkar is, is how his acceptance has changed. In character when the Sakharam Binder was done, I was told by Shaman. When they first did it, they couldn't get a theatre. They were shocked by it. They couldn't get a theater and so on. But this time, recently when they did it, they couldn't get an audience. And people came, it was, I mean, you know, it had, um, it's kind of an dated. Shanta, what's your take? If you read into what he says, which I like to do, because on the surface, he is not making a very coherent argument. But I know where he's coming from, because I come from the same space. As far as Tenulka's treatment of his women is concerned, um, and each time he uh, seems to deprive them of agency. Every single time you take Gidhade, there is this very innocent young woman married to a horrid man and he has tortured her and ill-treated her uh, entirely because she is supposedly barren. And at the end of the play, when he is leaving his father's house, she follows him like a docile lamb. So similarly in Kanyadan, and Girish's point is well taken, that here's a grown-up woman who's chosen to marry a poet who happens to be a Dalit. And yes, she's been brought up in a liberal household where caste hasn't mattered. But ultimately, the choice is hers. And if she comes back and throws it at her father and says, it's all on your account, and the father says, please don't go back to him. You have a choice. We aren't going to kick you out. Stay with us. Mm. And then, passive aggressively, she says, no, this is the future that I've chosen for myself. And I'm going and I will endure it. So if it's a future you've chosen for yourself, why did you in the first place blame your father? 
how can we ever call this a, a, a progressive play? So I think uh, Girish is right in what he is trying to say, but I would say he's trying to say it. He's getting it a little skewed. Ultimately, the play that may remain of Tendulkar's is in fact Gharsharam Kotwa. You know, because it's something he responds in his own history. Now, there is hardly any thinking in it, but it's beautifully written. Bhaskar Sangha or logic is just, just blue. The, and to see it for the first time was <laughs> Karan saw it and imitated it in his Kannada place. So, and that was the excitement, you see, because when Sakharam Banda was done, no, Ghasharam Kutwal was done, there was an uproar in Pune. They wouldn't let them do the rehearsals. And I was the uh, director of the film institute. So I said, come, come. I gave them my theatre. So, you know, one got, you know, involved. And I said to my students, see the play. It's compulsory that you, you see a Marathi play. And, and uh, that holy, I remember, they all came singing to my house saying, Shri Ganaraya Narthana Kari. So, Giving rehearsal space to Ghashiram when Girish was the director of FTII was not the first or the last time that Girish used his positions of power and privilege to support the other people. We've just heard how he brought a largely neglected Antha Yug back to prominence with the Sangeet Natak Academy Award. But Shanta, you mentioned how um, at a conference just after Habib Tanvir had been attacked in Madhya Pradesh, Girish spoke up for him as the chair of a panel and he condemned that assault in the strongest terms. But let's also talk about something else that Girish did when he was chairman of the Sangeet Natak Academy. He organized the Nehru Shatabdi Theatre Festival in 1989. How do you organize a festival called Nehru Shatabdi Festival? It has to uh, reflect in some way his kind of view of the nation as a diverse nation and yet united. So there were all the language plays had to be there. There were also classical Sanskrit plays, Bhasa's Urubhangam for one, and I know it's one of Girish's favorites. You were there at this festival, Sunil, with a play no less than the mighty Andha Yug. I didn't know the story about, you know, how Girish had actually stuck his neck out to recognize and give recognition to Andha Yug. But when the Nehru Shatabdi festival took place, Dubey was actually invited to revive Andha Yog for the festival. And I was a part of that production. And Dubey had kind of gathered cast of, you know, magnificent actors, very well known and very, very accomplished actors. And they were very busy. And we kept hearing that Dubey is rehearsing with them somewhere, either individually as a group, we never saw it. I, I was only witness to the younger actors having to go through the, you know, his usual rigorous and kind of process. And uh, then the, we all went to Delhi and uh, we set up at night. In the morning of the show was when all the actors arrived from different parts of the, of the country. And I think we just managed to have enough time to do one run through at Kamani before the first show at three o'clock. And there was great enthusiasm for the production. I think more because of the actors that were present on stage rather than the play itself. You know, it was very interesting that when that play traveled, that production traveled back to Bombay and we did a show at Sofia Bhava, it just did not work because A, it was being judged on its own and not in the context of a larger festival. But also interesting that Dubey, and he rarely does this, but he actually went against one of his own beliefs, which was never look back and revive a play. Once a play is done, it's done and it's best to leave it behind in that festival. I think Perhaps the only play that really worked was Chakra Viewer because it was done by young Ratantya and had just been produced. It was fresh. Let's step back from Girish's extracurricular activities and let's return to his plays, which are actually becoming more and more sophisticated. I mean, you know, frame narratives, layered, complex stories... 
just before Girish took over the Sangeet Natak Academy, he wrote the delicate, dreamy Nagamandla. And that opens with a frame story of a playwright who's been cursed and within that seamlessly brings together two other folk tales which combine to form an entirely new story. Sunil, you're attracted to this play, no? I'm, I'm completely hypnotized by its magicalness. It's truly, in a sense, very, very close to this whole idea of Indian storytelling, which is a mix of hardcore reality, facts, philosophy, discourse, but also fantasy, magic, eroticism. It has all these elements and also, you know, this wonderful theatricality of it. There's this writer who's stuck in a temple and he has to write this play or he's going to die. And you have these beautiful lamps that come in. I mean, it's just beautiful. There's the fire and the rain too, which is ostensibly about how one finds meaning in life. But it has a meta-narrative about theatre, about theatre's transformative power. Difficult to say, but the one I worked hardest and the one I think at the most, it's really like tapasya, sitting and working, was fire and the rain. You see, because it started, as I said, Professor Shah once said to me when I was in college, Natya Shastra says, the first chapter of Natya Shastra, says that well, Brahma speaks of the, the powers of drama and so on, and the need for drama. He said, Kvashit Shamaha, the four uh, uh, Purusharthas are there, among them, you know. No. And Shah so said, would you, would anyone in Can uh, India take the challenge and say, yeah, I want to write a play with Purusharthas as the subject. You know, and it remained in my mind. Why not? Why not? Why not? <laughs> And if at a very facile level, not to, but my French, I'm laying myself open to. You know, in the Mahabharata times, there were two ways of approaching God. One, you either went through Homa, Havana, the, you know, or you went into the jungle and, um, you know, got God. Now, in, um, in my play, this man, Yavakri, goes into the jungle and uh, tortures himself and gets this, while Parovasu becomes a uh, priest, you know. And then the whole question of karma coming into the interplay of the drama, both in ritual, in everywhere, you know, karma, you know. And then the final scene of moksha, you know. No one would dare touch moksha. So I said, why not? Let me have moksha in my a scene. So, no, madam, this is a pompous claim or not, it does not. The point is, that's the kind of thing that drew me. Of course, you can't dismantle a play like that. So, For me, there's Tughlaq at one end and the fire and the rain at the other. When you read a play, of Girish Karnad, you cannot escape visualizing it. And for me, it, it, here was a play that was full of ideas of social divisions. You have a canvas which you can call Vishwaswaroop out there. And as I was reading the play, I, I just saw it happening in a huge open space. So the yagya had to be continuous, like the tanpura in music, just going on and on. And th there would be other spaces. There'd be a jungle space. There would be a, a, an outlying place where people are dying and uh, this performing group is trying to create a play. So there's that space. And there is the space of Vishakha and her father-in-law. That idea has stayed with me. And it has become stronger each time I have seen a production of The Fire of the Rain. 
because all these productions have taken place on the proscenium stage, which is the space that Girish actually rejected in his plays, in his ideas of theatre. So it is unfortunate that theatre wasn't able to rise to the challenge of The Fire and the Rain. Here's an excerpt from The Fire and the Rain, published in English in 1998. Kafil Jafri is Aravasu and Pritam Koil Pillai plays the actor. You said you had gone to bury your old man when you found me. You bury your dead, not cremate them. No, we are actors. We have been actors since the Lord of Creation entrusted the job to my ancestors. The earth gave us the body. When we are done, we hand over the job to our children and hand back the body to the earth. But the body will rot in the earth, surely. What, what are we in our mother's womb? Floating bits of flesh? Squiggly worms? To burn is to destroy. Neither the earth gets it nor the wind. Well, to each his beliefs. My ancestors were actors. And then why are you leaving town? We came here to perform a play for the sacrifice. But this town has not been good for us. The old man died. My brother's foot got infected. But how can you give up so easily? Surely you have a duty to your art. I, I couldn't agree more, but a body needs to be fed before it can act. In fact, even the gods who are bodiless need to be fed before they will act. Hence all these oblations. But there are no oblations without a performance. And there is no performance without actors. I don't have enough actors. It's as simple as that. May I... May I ask you something? Oh, go ahead. You don't mind? What is it? Will you watch me? What? Watch you? If I dance now, will you tell me if I am any good? You? I realize it sounds absurd. But but you're not an actor. You're, you're, you're a high caste... I used to be with the hunters most of the time. Dancing, singing. I like dancing. Well, well some other time. We'll, we'll be travelling together after all. I have other worries at the moment. Not bad. Not bad at all. It took me 30 years to write that play. When I told the story to Swachidev, he said, write it, write it now. And it took me 30 years to write the play. Because each time I started working, something new came. The fact that I suddenly realized somewhere, written in a book written by a poor scholar called Birsky on Natyashastra, that he, he points out that actually the Yajna was in fact a metaphor for everything in ancient India, including sex. You know, so it's described all over. You come across Yajna as, you know, and the Yoni as the Yoni of the, uh, you know, woman and all that kind of thing. And so here was a play. Here was a theme. An actor wanted to do a play and, you know, it's sort of bursting into... Uh, uh, the, the yajna and so on, so, so the mixing up, but that took very long to work out. There's a pun in it which very few people realize, or probably do realize. I don't know. He he says, "I prayed for Indra, and I remained celibate." You know, because you know I, I didn't have sex. That's what he means. Now I had all the knowledge in the world. But I didn't have that knowledge. I mean, you know, you know Indra was supposed to be cursed with eyes, which really meant um, uh, vaginas. He was called Sahasraksha. And she says, come 
I'll open the eye that Indra didn't open for you. A Kannada woman critic said, no character like that has appeared in Kannada ever. A woman sort of said, I opened my breast to you for my... Girish is talking, of course, about Bishaka in The Fire and the Rain. Shanta, we've talked before about Girish's female characters. It's strange that we are talking about his women after we have talked about Tendulkar's women. Because uh, Girish, to my mind, was a feminist. And uh, you can see that in all of his plays. And for me, the most uh, important character in that sense is Chitralekha in Yayati, where she challenges this man who has forced his son to take on his old age. She challenges him and says, I, as a young woman, have a right to a physical life with a man, a young man. I don't want this old man. And you're responsible, so (laughs) you take me. Otherwise, I'm having poison. And you see this with all the women in his plays. Padmini, Rani, Vishakha, obviously. Even the stepmother in Tughlaq. I suddenly decided that if I have to go in search of subjects, you know, because they don't come, as I told you yesterday, they don't come easily to me. I I have to look for them. At Tughlaq, I look for a history thing. Oh, and, uh, you know, and so on and so on. Then, let me see the lacuna in our tradition and try to fill it up. So I went, I said, Puranically. Now, what do I mean by Puranically? Let me go, not to Rama and Krishna, but let me go to um, Fire and the Rain. You know, that kind of thing. I said, I must enrich my tradition by writing plays. We had no stage of our own. You see, when you write, a a playwright writes, you respond to other playwrights. I was lucky. I had both the opportunity and I think I had the ability to see, because I had grown up in Yakshagana and so on, and Karanth had that ability. Because he had, because you know, Alkazi froze after time. He couldn't go anywhere. I mean, he started repeating himself. You know, this is still the problem, I think. The problem is these people have, don't have enough theatre. The theatre crowd here has become, a, again, a elitist. I had the great advantage of Canada. Mm-hmm. So I could sort of spend drunken nights with Karan. <laughs> you know, that's kind of It's been wonderful to have had all this time to talk to you about Girish and many Indian theatres. But as we close, I have one last question. What is Girish Karnad's legacy? How you look at the term legacy. Legacy can be an inspiration to do a certain kind of play. For that, do we think that Girish wrote a certain kind of play. Each of his plays is different. So, unlike certain other playwrights, he didn't stick to a single form of writing. So, in that sense, what is it that can be passed on to the future generations? So, uh, for me, it's more of a personal legacy that I can refer to. Because I first encountered Girish Karnad's play, however, then when I was very, very young and at a very impressionable stage where, you know, it's all very, very new to me. And then through Dubey, you know, a larger world of theatre literature that essentially was engaged with with the whole the question of ideas, okay? And I think that comes through very strongly, whether it's a Girish Karnad, whether it's Dube, whether it's a GP Deshpande. This is a, this is a body of work that really... Uh, enjoys dealing with ideas. And the thing about uh, Girish Karnad is that, as Shanta pointed out, you know, each of his plays are so very different, but he also dips into so many, he creates, opens up so many possibilities. I think Girish is unique.
You have been listening to The River Has No Fear of Memories, a series of conversations with Girish Karnad. We thank the Nilekani Philanthropies for supporting this series, Pallavi MD and Konarak Reddy for the original music, Gokul Abhishek, Gaurav Krishna and the Bangalore Studio for sound recording and engineering. At the Bangalore International Centre, our thanks to Lekha Naidu, Raghu Tenkaila, Saraswati MP, S. Sarvanna Raj, Rajashekhar B.N., Manas Sampath, and of course, V. Ravi Chandar. Ajay Krishnan, Sunil Shanbag, Vinod Ravindran, and Vivek Madan, thank you for being there when we needed you. Thank you also, Vivek Shanbag and Shanta Gokhale. Our special thanks to the Karnad family. Anmol Tiku and myself, Arshia Sattar, have put these episodes together from conversations that we had with Girish Karnad in June 2019.